Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Johnson. I'm the Freeman Chair in China Studies here at CSIS. Thank you all for joining us for what I think is going to be a really spectacular talk today on uh, Xi Jinping's sort of emerging foreign policy strategy and how we can look at his first trip abroad in that context. Um, we're very honored, of course, today to have two very distinguished uh, panelists joining us. Uh, Dr. Zbigniew Brzezinski really needs no introduction, but <laughs> give a few highlights. He is obviously a CSIS counselor and trustee and co-chairs the CSIS advisory board. Board. He's also a senior research professor of international relations at the School of Advanced International Studies, Johns Hopkins University here in DC, and co-chair of the American Committee for Peace in the Caucasus, and a member of the International Advisory Board of the Atlantic Council, and of course had a very distinguished career in government. Uh, Dr. David Lampton, or as we call him Mike, <laughs> is uh, currently the George and Sadie Hyman Professor and Director of China Studies at SAIS. Uh, he served as the SAIS Dean of Faculty from 2004 to 2012 former president of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, and past director of China Policy Studies at the American Enterprise Institute and the Nixon Center, among several other very distinguished positions. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the floor over to uh, Dr. Brzezinski, and we'll get going. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your kind words. Um, I have to begin by saying that I'm conscious very much of the fact that um, the other two participants in this panel know infinitely more than I will ever learn about China. So I am a little bit like a student in front of them. But let me nonetheless go ahead and share some thoughts with you. First of all, regarding President Xi's foreign policy and his recent expedition. When I look at that expedition to Moscow and then to the meeting with the BRICS, I really have the sense that he's been engaged essentially in a search for geostrategy rather than engaging in a serious strategic undertaking. And the meeting with the BRICS, I think, is lip service to a current fashion in judgments regarding international affairs because the BRICS don't really amount to anything as an institution or as an organization or as a, or as a shared strategic perspective. It just happens to be a number of interesting, promising, but very unequal, extremely unequal states. On the one of which is a genuine uh, global power. For even the Soviet Union is not a genuine global power except for one factor which is not all that usable. Namely, it has a lot of tools with which to commit suicide. <laughs> yeah. And that's not exactly something that you can fully base your foreign policy on. So I thought the BRICS exercise is really a waste of time. And my guess is that President Xi is not going to be spending too much dealing with that. More important was the stop in Moscow and the choice of going to Moscow first. I don't know to what an extent it really was a choice. I have a sense, but I have not reviewed it carefully, perhaps my colleagues have, that his past schedule of reciprocal meetings involved an obligation at this stage to go to Moscow. And the Russians tried to make something out of it, quite understandably. He was the first foreign statesman ever admitted to inside the special war-waging high command center of Soviet armed forces. And that's a special place which we have had a long time interest in and which we specifically targeted many years ago. Um, but, of course, we didn't have him in mind in so doing. <laughs> um, more importantly, of course, was also the fact that the Chinese renewed a number of contractual obligations with the Russians regarding the purchase of more advanced Russian weaponry. And that, of course, reflects their national interest it also reflects Russian interest. The Russians perhaps see in it as a step towards some sort of a joint partnership vis-a-vis -vis the outside world, but I suspect that the scope of that calculation is limited both in case of the Russians and of the Chinese. It's an accommodation of convenience and specifically focused on some current issues to which I'll turn. The fact, however, that the Chinese buy weapons from the Russians does reflect a certain necessity for the Chinese. 
And it raises an issue in my mind regarding how legitimate that necessity is today. I have this in mind. Some of our NATO allies feel quite free in selling weapons to Russia. And the French particularly have sold, sold some highly advanced weapons um, to the Russians. Is it really in the interest of the West to be maintaining an ironclad boycott on the sales of weapons uh, to China? Some other Western powers sell quite a few weapons to India. Is it really in the interest of the West to be that clear cut in terms of assisting the military programs of two major countries, one of which is viewed by the Chinese as a protagonist, potentially, and one of which with the Chinese have a complicated relationship. I think it's something to at least think about, <coughs> to at least think about. Yeah, I would surmise that perhaps even from our own point of view, it would not be bad if the situation became more diversified. In any case, the above has been taking place in a much more important setting than these two issues, namely a rising friction in the relationship between the United States and China. And this rising friction has been taking place over the last year. It certainly involves a significant change of atmosphere and shared outlook from the joint Hu Jintao uh, Obama communique of January uh, 2011, which clearly spelled out a comprehensive global partnership. There are obviously some reasons for it. Uh, to some extent, perhaps the Chinese themselves initially overstated the degree to which China is now viewed as a world power to which its neighbors have to accommodate and took a very hard-nosed position, both vis-a-vis -vis the Vietnamese and the Filipinos regarding the South China Sea issues, including some actions which could be interpreted as preemptive. Uh, I think that has been a source of some tension. And of course, the United States uh, responded, perhaps in one case, particularly in the Filipino case, in a manner which encouraged the aggrieved party, the Filipinos, to overdo their subsequent reaction. And we had to kind of make it clear to the Filipinos that at least at this stage in history, we're not prepared to start World War III over that issue. And I think that perhaps was helpful. But the more serious problem arose, I think, as a consequence, an unintentional consequence of a very major speech delivered by the President of the United States in November of last year. I have in mind, of course, the famous pivot speech. Although the president has said that he himself never used that word, there is one, however, citation which does involve his use of that single word. But I think it's rather interesting that he doesn't feel himself committed to that word. It was, of course, endlessly interpreted by the mass media and in a fashion which, of course, was not particularly congenial to the Chinese. The Chinese, in fact, have seen it as essentially a hard-nosed formulation of an American intention to rein them in, perhaps to surround them. And that, I think, has been a problem uh, both for us and also for them. The speech, after all, was very sound in its fundamental assumption. The United States is indeed a transatlantic, and I emphasize the word trans, transatlantic power. It is also a trans-Pacific power and has been so since 1905. It might have been worthwhile to reiterate that proposition rather than to argue that we have to adjust our forces because the war in Afghanistan is coming to an end. We can now deploy more to the Far East and as a sign of our serious intent, we will now be deploying forces in a portion of Australia. Even though, to my knowledge, at this stage, Australia is not threatened by, for example, an invasion from Papua New Guinea. <laughs> uh, so it is probably not surprising that the Chinese concluded that we must have somehow them in mind. And if one looks now at Chinese public reactions to that speech and to what's followed it, 
they have become rather antagonistic, in some cases rather extreme. I recently gave an interview to Renmin Rinbao at their request about the overall nature of the American-Chinese relationship. And um, I've always been quoted by them very accurately in previous interviews. In this one, large segments of what I said were cut. Uh, and so I've checked what was cut. And what was cut was my point made in the course of the interview to the effect that both sides ought to cool it and to be particularly careful of the rhetoric. And that is particularly applicable to the Chinese mass media because the Chinese mass media are not known for taking positions contrary to the Chinese government. And therefore, one can view what they say as somewhat authoritative and not as comparable to some statements by American mass media. The comparison really is to official American statements. And here are some quotes, just, uh, just a few quotes. Uh, for example, from Renmin Rinbao in relationship to the president's speech. America's overall goal is to secure total control of the Eurasian continent. And the purpose of clearing the perimeter is to pave the way for ultimately subduing China and Russia. Another quote. Um, the United States is trying to exclude China's economic interests and political influence from Africa, choke off China's vital energy supplies in the Middle East, and find and support countervailing forces around China. In East Asia, it is going straight for the vital points of China's security and development. Um, judging by the historical experience of the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union, containment will surely be accompanied by murder. This is from the official organ of the Chinese Communist Party. A couple of more examples. Um, Liao Wang, I think that's a military paper, isn't it? Or what is it? Intellectual, Intellectual paper. Um, the strategic objective of the United States is to ensure its leading status in the entire Asia Pacific region, build a trans Pacific order centered on the United States, and continue its Pacific dominance. The key link here is to sow discord in the good, neighborly, friendly, and cooperative relations between China and countries on the periphery. Um, here is a, an item from the military journal, Jifang Junbao. We, China, should cast away that pacifism and romanticism which will easily evolve into capitulationism under pressure and threat. We should make full struggle preparation for war and war preparation. Only by doing so can China maintain a longer period of peace and development. Now, all of these items were omitted from the interview in which I was pointing out that one of the tasks that behooves both of us, China and America, is to contain the language, to contain the level of debate, and that behooves us on the official level, that behooves the Chinese. And I made the further point that in the case of the Chinese, it may not be wise even for the Chinese government to so arouse its public opinion that Chinese nationalism will become extreme and force itself, impose itself, even on the rational calculations of the Chinese government, so that we have a shared responsibility here, in effect, to manage the relationship responsibly. Now, all of that, however, doesn't lead me to some drastic conclusions. I think we are at a stage in which it is important for both of us to undertake efforts to calm the situation down. We have that obligation, for example, in the Chinese-Japanese discourse over the islands. Some recent statements by our closest friend in the Far East, Japan, have been quite belligerent, especially to what might happen if some Chinese were to land on the islands and how military action may be taken by the Japanese in reaction. It's a kind of statement which is not helpful publicly because it then compels the Chinese to assert themselves in equally categorical terms, and an escalation take, can take place. 
So there is an obligation here, it seems to me, on us, but also on the Chinese, to try to act in a manner that contains the problem. We have seen some signs of uh, Chinese cooperation with us on North Korea. The public position by the Chinese to the effect that no country in the region has the right to plunge the region into disorder was clearly pointed at the North Koreans. I'm struck by the fact, incidentally, that the North Koreans, after weeks and weeks of blustering and threatening, have all of a sudden quietened down. And I wouldn't be surprised if there was a private communication from the Chinese to the North Koreans, not shared with us, so that we would not be viewed as somehow or other influencing the Chinese to act on their own, but acting on their own, saying to the North Koreans, there are limits to what we can do for you and have no illusion regarding the consequences of your deliberately plunging this part of Asia into a conflict. The consequences for you will be dire, and we might take steps to make sure that you're not able to do it. Yeah. I think something of that sort might very well have transpired. Of course, all of that requires deliberate guidance for the future. And here I would like to end simply by quoting to you from a rather interesting analysis published quite recently a statement by the newly appointed Deputy Chief of Staff of the People's Liberation Army, General Xi, who lays out a longer-term strategic vision for the security of China and its military relationship with the United States. It's a tough-minded statement, but a very modern outlook, somewhat not unsimilar to our own statements on national security issues but up to date, focusing on the critical issues and differentiating between tactics and strategy, strategy and geostrategy, strategy and so forth. And in it, he even has some passages that struck me as remarkably reminiscent to my recent book, um, which of course was gratifying for me to read. <laughs> um, but the point that he makes as a critical point in asserting China's ability to be a great military power as time unfolds itself, is one with which I agree. And I think it's quite striking that he says it so explicitly. Let me read to you what he said. If we only stare at the issues at the forefront over the next three to five years, points of disagreement will exceed the points we have in common, talking about China and America. If we focus on the next one or two decades, the points we have in common may exceed our points of disagreement. If our eyes can see a little further, we may find even more things in common. That seems to me to be a rather deliberate reiteration of the primacy in the Chinese view of a stable and over time essentially a, co a cooperative, accommodating relationship between America and China. And I think this is exactly something that we should be conscious of, of also in our definition of the relationship. And this is why I do hope that before too long, serious efforts will be made to reignite a bilateral dialogue at the highest level between President Obama and President Xi which will reaffirm what was said in the January 2011 communique and go beyond it in keeping of this, in keeping with this uh, suggestion, namely that we start looking further and further ahead as the world changes and in which our relationship is so critical to global stability. Thank you. Well, thank you for all coming, thank you to CSIS and uh, you, Chris, and uh, Dr. Brzezinski. I, uh, I didn't find anything I disagreed with, and I'd, I'd emphasize a couple points. We didn't collaborate on these, these comments, but I think there's substantial uh, um, uh, agreement, although I make different points. I would agree with the, the proposition that I'm not too worried about the BRICS as a geostrategic uh, consideration here. Uh, I also uh, think that Sino-Russian relations have intrinsic difficulties with them, so I'm not all that worried about that either. Uh, and uh, I would certainly agree that while our interests across the Pacific are getting greater and greater, and we ought to 
devote more comprehensive attention to that. I think the way the pivot was rolled out was uh, uh, pretty effective in heightening Chinese anxiety, and to some degree we're seeing the blowback uh, from that. So if those were some of the implications of what you said, I, I certainly uh, agree. Um, the task, as I saw it, was to talk a little about really where I see Chinese foreign policy going in the wake of the 18th Party Congress, of which the trip uh, is certainly a one, one part. Um, and I think what I have to say, I even found as I was preparing for this, I was a little more sober uh, and um, concerned than I've been in a number of years. And I had to keep reminding myself we're talking at the strategic and, and focusing on military and military related issues, we've got to keep in mind this relationship is much more comprehensive and there are lots of other dimensions about which we could be much more positive. I'm not going to focus on those, but I think it's important to just remember what some of them are. Our trade just passed in 2011, half a trillion uh, dollars. That uh, obviously we've got financial interdependence during the, the financial global financial crisis. China was really quite helpful, actually essential in the management of that crisis, very much to everybody's uh, 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 gain. Uh, certainly, just looking at students, I don't. I think we're probably over 200,000 Chinese students here, and we're not even counting those in primary school and high school uh, at that. So certainly, that's great. Governors from all the states are going over to China, soliciting foreign direct investment in their states, and congressmen combine for it in terms of their districts and states and so forth. So that, I think, is uh, all to the good. Uh, we've got government-to-government uh, -government agreements uh, between agencies uh, all the way from the EPA to the Coast Guard and so forth. So th the basic point I want is that I'm, I'm going to be talking in the zone that's the most conflictual in U.S.-China relations and about which I am very concerned. But there is a broader relationship, and I think a total uh, discussion needs to make that uh, clear. T to be frank, uh, there's been a developing strategic character to U.S.-China relations that I find extremely worrisome and uh, I think uh, uh, has, has been exacerbated in some sense by what's happened since the 18th Party Congress. I would have liked to have been much more positive coming out of the trends I see out of the 18th Party Congress, but I find it difficult uh, to do that. And let me just uh, uh, sort of overall summarize what, what I think, if I had to kind of paint the four or five characteristics of the Chinese diplomatic st and security strategy, what I think the, the game plan uh, is. Uh, first of all, I think the truism that China remains most concerned and its leaders most concerned about domestic development and maintaining an international environment conducive to development, I think that is the key underlying lining point. I think the Chinese are, however, pursuing some policies that are not going to produce that international environment, uh, and that is where uh, the rub is. But I think there is a consensus over the primacy of internal economic development and the need to have as pacific, meaning peaceful, international environment as possible. I don't think that point's been tossed out by uh, any means. But I think there is a big but, and I, I base what I'm saying on both what I'm reading, the recent defense white paper. I did some interviews in China in September and again in January. Uh, and so there, and, and also an interesting interview by Qi Jianguo, the gentleman that uh, Dr. Brzezinski met, mentioned, the Deputy Chief of Staff for Intelligence and Foreign Affairs for the uh, Ministry of Defense uh, for the People's Liberation Army. Uh, and basically, I think they are trying to establish regime legitimacy in the eyes of their people by standing up for Chinese dignity, to not put a very fine a point on it, uh, and that the regime feels it needs to consolidate its credentials both with its own people and with the People's Liberation Army. And so there's going to be a period of time which we are living through in which the Chinese are emphasizing those two tasks at some cost to their potential peaceful external environment and at some potential cost to both their neighbors and the United States. In other words, domestic consolidation of the new regime is the priority of the year. Now I think they have in mind, after they've accomplished that, they then are going to move back towards more familiar kind of foreign policy. I think that's more than hope. I think there's some analysis that lies uh, behind this. 
So in the short run, I, I tried to think of a little a phrase that I think captures the spirit as well as the content of what the Chinese are doing. And then I call, call it show the steel, meaning the military, kind of enhance deterrence, enhance our credibility, and show that you have diplomatic options. In other words, China's trying to establish a sen their, the regime a sense of credibility that will enhance its capacity to operate in the future, uh, deter future challenges. Uh, but this is, this is, in a sense, you, I was interested, Dr. Brzezinski, you said much of what Xi Jinguo had to say and what you've been reading is rather modern in its, its phraseology. I would say also, if we were trying to think of an American uh, analog for the, the, the sense that the Chinese have, I think it's something we would recognize as peace through strength. I think that's what they're trying to establish right now. Now, uh, the white paper that was just issued this, this month says uh, about Chinese uh, military and uh, security goals, build a strong national defense and a powerful armed forces which are commensurate with China's international standing. Well, if China's already the number two economy and heading towards the number one in at least aggregate terms, this raises the issue, what is enough in terms of the definition of military capability? Uh, now, once you've established this credibility at home and established deterrence abroad, and I think there's the next part of this strategy, and that is China's in a parallel track trying to develop a diplomatic alternative and a, a way to develop consensus while China is taken seriously. And I think it's really this new type, big power relationship. And so I think the hope is that China, among China's leaders, we're going to enhance our credibility, our deterrence. We're going to show the steel. We're going to show we have backbone. We're going to get the, the support of the PLA. We're going to get domestic support. But we are going to turn to in our foreign policy towards a more cooperative, familiar face of the last uh, decades. The problem, it seems to me, is they may so alienate the environment both near in and uh, at greater distance, including the United States, that that day of diplomacy is going to be either pushed off or much more difficult. But I don't think China's abandoned its basic strategy, but it has placed importance, I think, primacy in the next year or two on its own domestic consolidation. Now, uh, let me uh, give you some evidence, uh, evidence uh, over the last six months. I'm not going back into the 2009 and 2010, but just since, basically since the 18th Party Congress. In January of this year, uh, Xi Jinguo wrote a piece for, uh, actually CSIS, or CNA sent it out, I'm sorry. Uh, but it was a very interesting uh, article written by the Deputy Chief of Staff of the PLA. This isn't a retired officer. This is a guy with responsibility. Uh, and I agree with Big that what he says is very interesting and in not all respects negative by any means. But he wrote for the Central Party School and he said something that fits with this uh, the idea that I just conveyed to you. We need to make relevant countries, I read U.S. for relevant countries here, under, and maybe Japan, uh, understand that we have a strategic resolve to use the necessary means to defend our sovereignty, that we have the firm will to defend national interests from being violated and cause them, these certain countries, to abandon the idea of taking chances. It's a kind of peace through strength and deterrence kind of notion. We've got to show people we're serious. I think this is a very powerful uh, motive. Secondly, in the, just the white paper in, just issued this month, it goes farther in authoritatively identifying the U.S as part of, if not a major part, of the problem. It says, some country, meaning the United States very clearly, strengthened its Asia-Pacific military alliances, has expanded its military presence in the region, and frequently makes the situation more tense. 
On the issues concerning China's territorial sovereignty and maritime rights and interests, some neighboring countries are taking actions that complicate and exacerbate the situation. And Japan is taking, making trouble over the Diaoyu Islands. Major powers are vigorously developing new and more sophisticated military technologies, including space and cyber. So once again, this kind of sense of multi-dimensional threat, uh, the U.S. with a, let us say from their point of view, not constructive overall strategy, uh, and China has to stand up and be credible in the face of this. Uh, in my interviews in September and again in January, uh, it's very clear to me, it was very clear to me if you ask, well, what are they doing on the Nansha or the Scarborough Reef or, or now Senkaku Diaoyu uh, Islands? It seems to me their basic approach is to say, if you, meaning the Vietnamese or the Filipinos or the Japanese, upset the status quo, we're going to define a new status quo and it's going to be less satisfactory to you. And I think we can, we can see this. This is showing the steel. We're not looking for trouble, but if we find it, we're going to establish a new status quo we can defend with our own security-minded community and with our population. So I think that uh, is a clear uh, piece of evidence here. If you look at uh, Xi Jinping's trip abroad uh, to uh, Russia and Tanzania and South Africa and the Republic of Congo, uh, indeed his next trip may, may be to Central Asia. But this is the part of the strategy of saying, you know, we've, the U.S., the, the slot phrase is the U.S. is the most important single bilateral relationship. I think the Chinese still believe that. But the more they say it, of course, they feel they lose a little credibility and leverage. So I think they're trying to show they have some diplomatic options out there. I agree with this big. Uh, the, I, I don't see the, the bricks. Um, <clears throat> And uh, one of my interviewees said, that, you know, sometimes people just tell you the truth. And th th this, I, I take careful notes, as Carla will note in our many meetings in China. Uh, Xi Jinping is following these lines, I was told. Tough with Japan, tough with the United States, closer to Russia. And once he consolidates his power, we'll be better to the U.S. So I think there's this kind of short run, long run kind of uh, a view, view that uh, they also have. There's also increased emphasis, if you look at the white paper that was just issued uh, this month, much more emphasis on deterrence, which in a way I take to be a proactive. For many years we've always said the Chinese are reactive. They wait for something to happen and then they, they have a, a powwow and try to figure out what to do. I think China is proactively looking at places that it could be challenged and thinking how uh, to deter it. And uh, the, the white paper, I think, was very clear. It said, resolutely deter proact proactive action which undermines China's sovereignty, security, territorial integrity, and firmly safeguard China's uh, core national interest. So a, a much t um, more vigorous assertion of deterrence is not waiting and then figuring out what to do, but figuring what threats you might face and trying to create a calculus in the mind of the other that will inhibit them from doing it uh, in the first place. Um, <clears throat> I think another part of this is really to, on the part of Xi Jinping, uh, differentiate himself from Hu Jintao. And I have the feeling he sent out people to basically say, I'm not Hu Jintao. One of my inter interviewees said, you know, she is the kind of person that if you're tough, he'll be tougher. If you're soft, he can be softer, <laughs> right? So don't mess with this guy. It's, it's almost like when we get new presidents from time to time, they need to, the first crisis is always the most dangerous because they don't want to look like they can be pushed around. I think uh, this isn't entirely alien to the way the Chinese may uh, be looking at this. So if what we're seeing is this kind of strategy to establish credibility, both in the international system and at home and with the military, and then a hope to move towards a more diplomatic future once you've accomplished that, uh, then uh, you know, what, the, the, the last issue, and I'll get off uh, after just briefly addressing that, is so what's going on in China that accounts for this beyond just the, readers, the leadership change uh, itself? 
And I, I, I have about five little factors I'll just kick out here. Um, one is that China's got more resources to do whatever it wants than it's ever had in modern history. And in case you think that's sort of a, a, an, an imposed construct, the white paper just issued this month said China's over, overall national strength has grown dramatically. That, that isn't what the Chinese used to not very long ago be saying. They always emphasize their tr problems. And now we've got that. Another, and I think, uh, I believe misjudgment, I think we are a very resilient society. But, you know, Qi Jian Guo in the, the, the remarks I mentioned, he says, the position of the United States and Western forces is on the decline. I think that's a, on mul multiple levels, and not a very productive way to be thinking about this. Uh, but I think it's there. Public opinion and the foreign policy, talk to anybody, particularly in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, constantly talks about the importance of public opinion as a constraint on their ability to accommodate. Indeed, most people in the foreign ministry, if they're candid, say we don't have as much clout in the system as we've had at many points uh, in the past. Uh, finally, I think if you're just trying to understand what's going on in China, I think there's been very substantial change in the political system over time. That doesn't mean towards, it doesn't mean democratic, but it does mean change. And the way I would characterize that is that basically Chinese leaders are weaker with respect to each other than they used to be. They're weaker with respect to society than they used to be. Uh, the bureaucracy and society are more divided and pluralized and these somewhat less uh, or weaker leaders are unable to fully control or as fully control as they would like this pluralization and social groups are becoming more empowered meaning capacity to have talented people have money have information so you have a more powerful society weaker leaders and greater division in society and so I think this, this strategy that I've described has some bearing, or has some, bears some relationship to these fundamental changes. Now, I think China wants to get to the long run, China's leaders. I think they want to have that discussion about a new type of big power relationship. But what is the new big power relationship? It's one where you cooperate with us, we share responsibility in the world, and you respect our interests on an equal basis. In other words, they're trying to establish a new status quo that reflects the prerogatives of a stronger China. And the question that really is for us is can we live with that? Thank you. Okay, uh, some very thoughtful comments. And uh, before we go to the floor, and I'm sure you guys are very eager to question uh, our, our panelists, as am I, uh, and some really uh, excellent remarks. Let me just add a few thoughts of my own, just based on what I just heard. Um, I think something to bear in mind, and, and I'm really glad that, uh, uh, Spig, that you highlighted these things that are appearing in the Chinese media, because oftentimes you get the impression that uh, the Chinese sometimes feel that, you know, one of their greatest sort of secret weapons, if you will, is Chinese, the, the language, that no one in the outside world is actually reading Chinese and paying attention to what's being said in their domestic media, you know, and so on. And so it can be quite shocking, I think, to them sometimes when Western people show them these, <laughs> these things or acknowledge that they understand what's being said. That said, I'm less concerned, I think, by the overall tone of this, because what I look to is, especially at the 18th Party Congress, was something that I thought was very significant, which was this idea, again, of a reaffirmation in the key documents of the 18th Party Congress of the idea of a period of strategic opportunity for China. Um, this is a very sort of fundamental strategic guideline that has been around in their system, validated by multiple party congresses now. And of course, implicit in this idea of a period of strategic opportunity through 2020 is that China calculates that at the end of the day, they have a benign external security environment that will allow them to focus primarily on their domestic economy and on their domestic development. And as such, for whatever commentary comes out about the, the pivot or rebound balancing and its containment orientation and so on, it suggests to me that fundamentally China still concludes that that external security environment is benign. And this is very important because if they conclude that the external security environment is not benign, then we have a problem because in my sense, that's when you start to see a race to the bottom in terms of competing interests and, and military rivalry uh, emerging in the region. So big picture, I think we're in, in, in pretty good shape. 
I agree entirely with what uh, Mike just said regarding domestic consolidation as the number one priority for this year for Xi Jinping. Anything that he does on the foreign uh, sort of circuit, if you will, will be primarily designed to help him uh, with that process of consolidation. And I'm also glad that both of my colleagues uh, took the time to uh, sort of look at and, and uh, spend a lot of time talking about what we see in these, in these key sort of domestic pieces of media that are put out. Uh, the one thing that is reassuring to me as a longtime China analyst in that with all the societal change that Mike talked about, the official media is still the official media. And in fact, it can be quite comforting <laughs> as, a, as an analyst looking at that and trying to understand what they're talking about this. And I think what was really striking to me in the sort of coverage of Xi Jinping's initial foreign tour abroad was actually a piece that appeared in the overseas edition of People's Daily uh, on April 5th. And frankly, they basically came out and it was the first effort in my mind to start defining Xi Jinping thought, uh, for lack of a better term. Uh, and that's striking for a couple of reasons. One, it's uh, amazing to me that for a leader who you know had just literally become president two weeks before that they were already putting trial balloons up in this direction. It's it says something to me about the speed with which Xi Jinping is consolidating power uh, within the system, which I think is very important for all of us as outside observers to understand. Secondly, as interesting as the kind of emphasis on a new style of great power relations has been, especially with regard to vis-a-vis -vis with this uh, US, Sino-US relations, what was striking to me in this piece was it talked more about great power diplomacy <laughs> rather than a new style of great power relations. And this phrase of great power diplomacy is quite interesting. This is something that Jiang Zemin used a little bit at the tail end of his uh, tenure in the late 1990s. And I'm quite confident, although Mike will correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that it wasn't used at all during Hu Jintao's uh, period. And now it's back, and that's quite interesting. And even more interesting to me is the way that it's being defined now in the Xi era as compared to how it was defined in the Jiang era. In that earlier area, there was an idea of China should act as a great power when it is capable of doing so, but very much being mindful of overall U.S. supremacy in the international system. In the current context, as it was defined by this piece quite bluntly, it noted that new style great power relations or great power diplomacy is a function of a relationship of equality among the major powers, and it named the United States and Russia quite specifically. And I think that signals a fundamental shift. It speaks to what Mike was just talking about, about this idea of respect and acknowledgement of China's growing global rise and influence. And then a quick point on this idea of the bureaucracy and the weaker leaders and so on. And I think this is something we're really going to have to watch because I think what Xi Jinping appears to be signaling so far is something quite fundamental. My sense is Hu Jintao was more than willing to be sort of uh, almost pushed around, if you will, by the bureaucracy on many major foreign policy issues. I think Xi Jinping so far and what he's been doing and saying has been trying to signal I'm the party secretary, I'm the boss, and I make decisions about what we do you know, on these sort of things. And I'll listen to you as advisors, but I'm going to be the one who's setting the policy. And I think we've seen several instances where either through bureaucratic assignments and the way things have uh, shaped out of following the leadership transition or from statements that he's made, he sent a very strong signal to the party especially, but also the broader bureaucracy, that I'm the leader. And I'm, he's, I think he's trying to redefine and claim back, claw back some of that loss of authority, if you will. And then the other theme that I think we should all watch very carefully as he develops his foreign policy is, uh, to, to kind of uh, uh, paraphrase uh, James Carvel, it's the party, stupid. Uh, <laughs> Xi Jinping is taking steps to sort of re-energize the party's control within the system. And I think this is extending into the foreign affairs sector as well. We haven't had, I don't think, formal confirmation of this yet, but the idea that it looks uh, very likely that, uh, you know, a, 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 that a different official uh, will come in, Wang Huning, will come in as the head of the party foreign affairs office. So uh, Yang Jiechi, who's now the state counselor, will not wear both of those hats in the same way that his predecessor, Dai Bing Guo, did. That will be very significant. They're taking a Politburo level official and putting him in charge of the party's official foreign affairs think tank. That says something to me about how Xi Jinping thinks about the party's role in shaping foreign policy. So with that, I'll uh, end my comments and we'll open it to the floor. And uh, please follow the standard CSIS rules, which are to identify yourself clearly. And please keep your comments to a minimum and ask a question. Uh, we'll go right to the middle there first. Thank you. My name is Dong Huiyu with China Review News Agency of Hong Kong. Uh, my question is for Dr. Brzezinski. According to the declassified document that was published by the State Department yesterday, uh, there were differences and even in fightings within the court administration. So yesterday, department. State Department published a declassified document uh, from 
1977 to 1980 uh, about the U.S.-China relations. So I, I mentioned the, the, the history. And you, uh, you are the key policymaker to push uh, the formal diplomatic relations with China, even though within the administration there were arguments that U.S. should put the uh, U.S.-Soviet Union reconciliation uh, be the uh, priority. So looking around the situation and global reality today, how would you see the U.S.-China-Russia triangle relations? Are you concerned about that China may align with Russia to balance the United States? Thank you. If I was a Russian leader, I would be a little more concerned about Russia, Russia's status in that relationship. Yeah. I don't think that it is the national ambition of Russia uh, to become, to put it very crudely, China's satellite in the larger triangular relationship with the United States. Uh, the fact of the matter is that outside the nuclear arsenal in which the Russians have enormous advantage over the Chinese, but an advantage that's really not politically usable except in a catastrophic suicidal war, in most of the other aspects of national power, the Chinese are now considerably ahead of Russia. Um, so it may be at this stage a transient arrangement of convenience with some economic significance to it. But in my judgment, it is not a major shift in the distribution of global power, nor does it involve any particularly enduring new arrangement. From the Chinese point of view, the Chinese know very well that their own well-being depends, in the final analysis, on a relationship with the United States that jointly contributes to global stability, and particularly to economic and financial stability. Russia is not a player in that. Insofar as access to Russian natural resources is concerned, the Chinese know they can have it if they can pay for it, because the Russians are very anxious to sell. In terms of demographic dynamics, they know very well that the Russians feel very weak about their position in the Far East. So it is a relationship which I think is tactically, perhaps, of some significance, but in my judgment, it is not a relationship that is capable of transforming the fundamental realities. And the most basic reality is that the American-Chinese relationship now is an interlocking relationship in which significant misjudgments by one or the other side adversely affects the other side. Um, let me just add to that real quickly, with, uh, and I think I agree 100% with all those points, and just to, just to sort of um, add one or two of my own, I, I think if you look at Xi Jinping's visit to Russia, actually, you can make the case that uh, for what it was designed to do, it almost backfired in, in, in some key ways, and especially the fact that, you know, Chinese, I happened to be in Beijing when this was happening, Chinese state television is arguing that a weapons deal had been signed, you know, as part of the, part of the agreement, and then the Russians come out the next day and deny the, the, that this is true. And having that been such a sort of underpinning of the Russia, you know, that and energy as the two key pieces of that bilateral relationship. To me, it ended up telegraphing the very serious mutual suspicion between the two sides in the relationship. And likewise, even on the energy deal, what do they have at the end of the day? They have an agreement to perhaps sign an agreement by the end of this year. And as Dr. Brzezinski just highlighted, it's going to be all over price, which it normally is. And, you know, that issue is going to be hard to, uh, to resolve. Uh, can I just Please, yeah. I don't want to drive excessive number of nails into this <laughs> coffin here that we're building, but, um, but in any case, I, I think there are a couple of things. The Russians have shown reluctance to have uh, FD, foreign direct investment from China in key areas. So, I mean, that, that speaks volumes. Uh, certainly the Russian military over time has been ambivalent They're about selling weapons to a country that has such an extensive boundary and has the history that that boundary has. Um, if you've ever been out in the Russian Far East, you see an awful lot of Koreans and Chinese, and that's not lost on Moscow. That's about, what, 10 time zones away uh, from that. So I think there's just a strategic imbalance. This, this 
this membrane along the Halong River, that the river boundaries there. Uh, I mean, you've got a million or two million, max three million Russians in that part, and you've got a hundred million Chinese just across this membrane, and you've had disputed territory in the past. So, uh, you know, uh, I, I guess I basically think that America structurally ought to be able to have better relations with either of them than they can have with each other, I think, in some way. Uh, in the back there. Yes, I'm uh, Dr. Sam Hancock of Emerald Planet, Emerald Planet TV, and uh, picking up on this theme, and this, any of the three of you, uh, the notion of energy security on China, you know they're going to almost the entire continent of Africa, uh, dealing in Southeast Asia and even into uh, South America, looking for secure uh, energy sources, uh, primarily from the uh, petrochemical side and fossil fuels, but yet they're very aggressively going after renewables as far as uh, solar and wind energy, among others. What do you see as the, uh, the policy or collaboration between the United States, uh, China, even Europe, uh, in these areas that would bring global stability, which is one of the key factors of what China is actually looking for, so they don't feel threatened uh, as far as access to some of the fossil fuels uh, in the Middle East and, and the African continent. And thank you for being here. But I just make, let me comment just on one aspect of it, and perhaps my colleagues can be more informative than I. I think the Chinese at this stage are quite worried about what is happening in the Middle East more than anything else. Africa, Latin America, these are longer term targets of opportunity, and I think the Chinese are doing pretty well on their own, and uh, I th don't think they feel particularly fearful of our ability to freeze them out and they feel reasonably confident about their ability to compete with us. And that's perfectly normal. The Middle East, I think, worries the Chinese. I think the Chinese are uneasy about the overall situation in the Middle East, dynamically unstable, but they're also worried about U.S. policy in the Middle East, <coughs> namely that it contributes to this dynamic instability and by being uh, either short-sighted or overly inclined to rely perhaps on military solutions to long-term political and historical problems. Uh, I have in mind more specifically in this instance the question of Syria, but of course in the background Iran <coughs> looms large and the Chinese have a very big interest in that. But on Syria, for example, we took the position from the moment of the crisis. The moment the crisis started, we took the position at the highest level publicly through the words of the president, Assad must go. That was the first explicit US policy response. Now, it just so happens that it was not really a dictation. It really was a wish, because there was no policy to make it happen. And there was good reason for us not to have the policy, because how would you enforce a statement like this unless you're prepared to invade Syria? And the more closely we have looked at it, the more we have come to realize that the situation in Syria is extremely complex and grave, and with enormous potential for spilling over into the Middle East as a whole. So our ability to really get involved is limited. Nonetheless, we persisted in our approach, tried to force through a UN Security Council vote, and since the Chinese deigned not to follow our instructions, and prevented the resolution from going through, we then publicly stated through a senior US government official that the Chinese position on this <coughs> subject has been infantile and disgusting. Not exactly an invitation to try to work out a joint approach. So I think the Chinese have do some concerns, but they're specifically oriented right now to the Middle East, and they stem less from antagonism towards us per se, strategic antagonism regarding the long-range problems of the Middle East, but more from considerable concern that perhaps we don't really have a realistic policy but are dug in for a variety of international and domestic reasons into a policy that makes it very difficult for a larger international response to be mounted. Um, I think another thrust of your question, if I understood correctly, is that energy is broadly speaking an area of cooperation with the U.S. which we've spent quite a bit of time talking about tensions and I would just note that the 
SED under Paulson and now the SNED have focused on this as an area of cooperation. And we're making uh, some progress, I think, on carbon sequestration and, and, and so forth. So it is an area where I think we're cooperating. Also, I just happened to be working with a colleague on a project on nuclear power, nuclear power plant uh, construction in China. And uh, of course, Westinghouse, Toshiba, and so on are involved in building several uh, plants there. It's actually, I think most Americans would be surprised the, the magnitude and the depth of nuclear cooperation between the United States and China. I think that's uh, all to the good. Just in terms of China's strategy, I think it, it's got a sort of a three-pronged uh, strategy. One is, is geographic uh, diversification. Uh, geographic diversification of the uh, energy sources. Uh, and so you see them operating in Latin America, uh, obviously Africa, uh, the Middle East, uh, Russia. There's no area that's too problematic for China not to be uh, uh, working with. Uh, and then transport diversification, pipelines, uh, 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 new shipping routes involving Burma and pipelines, rail transportation, uh, as well as, as ship more uh, through the regular sea lanes. And then also diversification of the kinds of energies. So, uh, you know, solar, uh, wind, biogas, uh, natural gas and fracking and all of this. So I think this is a really important area to cooperate in its own economic sense, not to mention the climate change. And I do think there is an area in the climate change where the United States and China can cooperate, and that China does have a useful concept of reducing the energy intensity of its GDP, so less energy consumed in generating uh, GDP, I think, is a way, uh, a framework at least, to begin about thinking about cooperation. Yeah, I would just add real briefly that uh, I think this is an area, climate change especially, is an area where we are seeing how the domestic in China drives the foreign, right? And if you look at the behavior in Copenhagen uh, several years ago on the climate change process, and now that we have est uh, established a new working group between the two sides on climate change, I think a lot of this is being driven by the pollution situation in China and the public reaction to that and the pressure that is building on the leaders to show that they're doing something about it. And that opens an opportunity which hopefully the U.S. side will, uh, will grab onto. Up here in the front. Hi, Chen Weihua, China Daily. Yeah, I want to go back to this catchphrase you, I mean, Dr. Lam Chen talked a little bit, bit about a new type of big power relationship, which President Xi today in Beijing mentioned again to Dr. Kissinger and H Hank Paulson. Uh, how, I mean, do you think uh, the Obama administration should interpret and respond and react to this call from Mr. Xi? The other is a really, you know, question, you know, some argue that uh, the problem of the relationship today is because there is no one in the Obama administration, someone like you and Hank Paulson, Kissinger, that make Chinese feel comfortable. Is that true? <laughs> in general, I think it's important for us to engage in a serious dialogue with the Chinese, which goes beyond just nice formulations. Uh, shared dreams uh, or common purposes, uh, China rising, global harmony, and so forth. Uh, that, those are very nice. Uh, I think, however, we have to realize that we have here at stake something which, if it works out well, will be historically constructive and without precedent, namely two powers, one rising, one already at the top, in a way engaging in some degree of collaboration. But if we don't reach that kind of level of partnership as a serious enterprise, which has to be spelled out concretely and not just in terms of adjectives, we run the risk of having a very complicated situation on the world scene. And what perplexes me a little bit in terms of China, and in that respect a little more so than in the case of America domestically, is what I sense to be the relatively high susceptibility of the Chinese public to become suddenly mobilized by intensely nationalistic feelings. If things go wrong, then there is this surge of public reaction, which is connected to some extent with the new pride, but also with a sense of historical mistreatment by the West, a sense of grievance, and the combination of pride and grievance produces 
really kind of highly intensely emotional reactions. And we saw that already a little bit in the last year and a half in the Chinese relationship with the Japanese, where Chinese masses, not the government, but the masses set the pace and the government had to cool things down because the pressure of the public became so strong. And that in turn, in my judgment, is related to the potential vulnerability of the ruling Chinese Communist Party if things don't work out that well. You know, what is the Chinese ruling Communist Party? It is essentially a bureaucratic organization which subscribes to the slogan communism, but is engaged in national development, very successfully so far, but also with a high degree of personal financial advantage for the leading echelons of that organization. It's perfectly right. It looks a little bit like the Republican Party in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> but, you know, is that strong enough? Is it good enough? And here what interests me in this context is the possible connection between what I've already mentioned, volatile nationalism, and if the party begins to fail in its ability to manage things, the rise of the military as an instrument of national will, national pride, national consolidation, uh, national aspirations. Because if you read, for example, the statement that I was quoting from by General Xi, it's not just a military statement. You just read that carefully. It's a political statement which deals with grand geopolitics. It deals with global trends. It defines China's position in that context. I have to say, I'm not a student of China, and maybe my colleagues will contradict me, but when I look back 10, 20, 30 years ago, I don't see Chinese top military figures engaging in public statements like this one. This could have been a statement, not just of a rising officer in the general staff, who probably would be the next chief of staff, it could have been the statement of the prime minister. It could have been, in parts, a statement of the president. So there is this military nationalism nexus in China's future that's a potential. And that could be highly, highly disruptive to international affairs and to the American-Chinese relationship. Um, to address more the detail of the, uh, uh, the whole slogan, a new type of major power relationship, I want to make two points. First of all, there seems to be a feeling among the Chinese that the United States at the official level hasn't as explicitly as apparently some in China would like you responded. Actually, I've gone back and looked. The U.S. has been consistent and favorable about talking about this general uh, concept. And President Obama uh, told then President Hu, and I believe his mid at the G20 meetings in Los Cabos, uh, that he accepted. Uh, Security Advisor Donilon gave a speech at the Asia Society, was very clear that we thought this was positive. And there ran a whole sequence of people, including the Leon Guanglie, uh, Chief of Staff, uh, visit here. Anyway, there's been a lot of discussion. Everybody agrees it's a great idea to talk about. But, the, and this gets to uh, the point that was just made, uh, the content's a little lacking, to say almost non-existent. Uh, and, uh, if I were just to throw out about three bullet points on what I think the content might, uh, the next step in trying to specify some content, is certainly building local level economic ties and increasing economic interdependence between the two societies. That would probably be step one. Step two was implied in the question, and Dr. Brzezinski is too modest to say, but in uh, any case, this relationship has worked best, in my view, when somebody's clearly in charge. Uh, and uh, I don't think that was necessarily the way I would have characterized uh, the first uh, Obama administration. It wouldn't be the way I would have characterized the first Clinton administration, actually. And the second one, he, he, he did better in that regard, in my, my view. So get somebody in charge, better management of the relationship, meaning mo more co coherence. Also, we've got to manage, and Dr. Brzezinski suggested this, third-party management. We helped on the Taiwan issue in 2003 and thereafter when Chen Shui-bin was uh, pushing the limits, let's put it that way. We've just now, we're hopeful that China, at least Secretary Kerry's hopeful that China's pushing North Korea. That's what needs to happen. Uh, when Japan gets a little 
over the top from a, the, our interest point of view. We need to be a little, uh, uh, let's see, clear in our uh, enunciation of our interests. So better third party management. Certainly we need better crisis management in military to military. And I noticed General Dempsey just met with Xi Jinping and there were a lot of the right words there, but let's see uh, what happens. I think we need, so in any case, I think you can give content to this idea in a meaningful way. And I hope the next stage of our dialogue will be to do just that. Okay. Um you have to leave now, Dr. Business. One more question, or do you have one more? Okay, we'll take uh, one more. One over here, back. Thank you. I'm Dan Bob with <clears throat> Sasakov Peace Foundation USA. Um, my question is about Japan-China relations, specifically about the uh, Senkaku's Diaoyu problem. Um, given some of the points that were made about the, the, the nationalism in China, the, the need for the leadership in China to uh, sort of show how tough it is, um, coupled with a more conservative Japanese government um, that uh, uh, by all appearances after an election coming in July may uh, focus more on security issues and territorial issues uh, rather than the economy. Um, one, there are many ways that I could see how the, the, this problem could ratchet up even beyond where it is now. But I, I wonder if the speakers could provide any suggestions on how this might be ratcheted down. Well, I made a suggestion uh, semi-seriously, but semi-seriously means that it was not entirely realistic, but was designed to point in a certain direction. I made a suggestion when I had the opportunity of talking to some senior figures, actually from Japan and um, from China separately. Namely, that if neither side uh, takes full charge of what is happening and is forced to respond to the actions of the other, we have a high probability of escalation and of something unpredictable happening. And then anything goes, emotions get unleashed, and depending on what trans specifically transpires, it could become messy, messy for each. And I said, why, you know, given the problems that you have in addressing this issue, because public opinion is engaged, and deeply so, profound feelings, uh, you have to go through certain motions. But on the other hand, you have to realize that the other side may be driven into a situation in which co collision then occurs. Why don't you sort of apply the kabuki dance uh, formula? Namely, you engage in certain well-timed demonstrations of your interest and presence but in such a fashion that neither your ships nor your planes are there at exactly the same time, but quite deliberately at times when you know they won't be there and they know you won't be there. And this way you can demonstrate to your public your continued commitment to the assertion of what you consider to be your legitimate rights, but at the same time you minimize what is otherwise a serious risk. And then, of course, both sides have to take into account the fact that the United States has taken publicly the position and that this is an issue in which the United States does have some residual responsibilities of semi-juridical uh, jurid, uh, juridical type, international law, and that we don't want to be forced into a situation in which we are forced to react, but, by, but pending our presence in that position for the foreseeable future, one cannot expect a one-sided resolution of it in benefit, to the benefit of one or the other side. So it's, I think, in the interest of both, in a sense, to dampen it down. It's hard to tell from what one observes whether that is happening. I have a sense that on the oratorical level, there has been some decline. But nonetheless, some gestures are still taking place. And then there is the volatile element, which may not be subject to control by either government fully, including even the Chinese, which is the fishermen themselves. Uh, it's not all that easy to police you know, a large number of fishermen who do these things regularly purely for the sake of economic benefit and personal survival. So that some incidents, incidents may be really the, the reaction of spontaneous interaction of variety of dynamic factors. Um, 
I agree with what was just said might have a little uh, more specificity. Uh, I think it was in the New York Times today. I read all three papers at the same time, but I think it was the New York Times had a remarkable picture mm -hmm. of Japanese and Chinese mm -hmm. ships passing in what it seemed, I don't know with a telephoto lens, in dangerously close proximity. And anybody... Going in the same direction. Yes, yeah. right. right. So in any case, that just seems to me a formula for, for, for problems here. Secondly, we, if we look back to the management of the Kwamoi Matsu and Taiwan Straits crises, you know, they ended up with alternate days of sort of firing propaganda shells back and forth. This is the Chinese version of Kabuki to which you were referring. I think they need to work out rules of the road by, whereby they can demonstrate to their people they're, they're asserting their respective claims without running the risk of claim. I, that is one of the implications when I said China's strategy when it's challenged is to create a new status quo. The new status quo is going to involve a more tangible kind of expression of Chinese claim in the future than it had in the, uh, the preceding the nationalization of the islands. So I think, uh, and, and apparently there is a, a, was at least scheduled to be a Japanese minister uh, going to talk about uh, this crisis. Anyway. I think in the past they've also had some crisis management discussions on this sort of under the radar screen. So I think they do, both sides seem to recognize they need to find a way that's politically effective for their people to deal with this. At the same time, it reduces the crisis. So I think we ought to do whatever we can. I would just say one other thing. The news has been full of uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe, and I think we need a little more uh, uh, firm evidence and data, so I'm just uh, raising issues that are in the news. But of course, when you have 168 legislators going to Yasukuni Shrine, uh, this creates a problem. I think it ought to, frankly, create a bit of a problem for the United States, too. Uh, and so uh, certainly that is, is an issue. Apparently there's a, a debate now about whether the Prime Minister in remarks that I don't know were more private in character questioned the nature of what is aggression and whether it was committed by Japan. So I mean whatever it is the Japanese uh, authoritative figures are saying I think we ought to encourage cooling the rhetoric. I would just add two quick points. One is this idea of with, with both sides flooding the zone, for lack of a better term, with ships and planes and everything else, you dramatically increase the, the likelihood of some sort of incident. So a, a mutual, if back-channel, agreement between the two sides to decrease the operational tempo uh, of both sides, especially maritime surveillance and Coast Guard, that would be very useful. I think, frankly, the other big piece that's missing here is what in the past had been a very robust uh, very sort of informal and solid back channel between the Chinese and Japanese leaderships using retired figures, generally speaking. That has completely broken down in the last several years, as you know well, Dan. And uh, I think that's something that both sides need to put some investment and political capital into revivifying, because that was very helpful at times in the past where we had some of these tensions spike, and both sides showed a willingness to, uh, to deal with it quickly. So, all right, well, I believe Dr. Brzezinski has to go, so uh, please join me in thanking the panel, and thank you for being a great audience. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.